Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Adobe Live. Welcome to Masterclass Friday. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Photography and Evangelist at Adobe, and it's my pleasure to be here once again on a Friday, beautiful Friday here in Atlanta, where we get to do our thing. When I say we, I mean the Adobe Evangelist. Um, many of us, there's more evangelists than, than you think, but many of us get to do our thing which is we get to stream on a Friday morning, afternoon, whatever it is, about our various disciplines. So you'll see things like Photoshop, graphic design, photography, uh, digital painting, UI, UX sometimes, and audio and video. So with that said, um, I'm happy to kick off my segment uh, and also wish, if I don't remember to do it, I should remember at the end, but just wishing you all a happy holiday, a Merry Christmas, whatever it is you celebrate, wishing you the best of it. Because this will be the last um, masterclass for me for this year. So I'll see you guys in the new year. Now, with that said, I thought I'd end things on a ask me anything. Basically, this is a Q&A session. This is a, hey, I've always wanted to get this question answered about, you know, Photoshop, Lightroom, whatever, photography related. And uh, I thought I would bring my question in. So I got some questions that were sent in up front. Got that list. I'm going to show you some new things that were just released in the past week. Uh, there was a December update to Lightroom uh, Classic and Lightroom on mobile. So we'll talk about those things first while you get your questions ready. I'll try and pay attention to both chats since this is about Q&A. Uh, when I say both chats, I know that some of you are looking at this on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Great. You can hang out there. We also have the main chat over on Behance, um, which is at b.net slash Adobe Live. So if you wanted to check that chat out, which is where the moderators are, so they can catch questions that I don't particularly catch, uh, or maybe I missed. Uh, so that's you're going to stand a better chance of getting your question answered over there. But again, I'll try and do both. So with that said, um, Oh, is that thing looping? Hey, I just noticed my lower third's looping. Hold on. Let's fix that. That's annoying. I'm on a different uh, setup for my stream, and so a lot of this was built from scratch, and that is one that... Uh, oh, that's the wrong one. Let's fix that title so that it doesn't keep looping. That's driving me crazy. It's got to be driving you crazy, too. All right. There we go. I took off loop and put it on hold, which is what it should be on. And now let's go ahead and pop out, pop back in. And now it should not loop like that. That was crazy. Let's not do that. All right. So with that said, um, let's go ahead and dive into the questions. I'm going to, again, show you some things that were updated first while you get your questions ready. The chat is logging all your questions in. So I start to see them in. I see the highs over on YouTube and Facebook. And I see the highs over on um on uh link or i'm sorry on behance as well and Mon or charlie for example for monterey great all right so i also see a first question coming in about changing color so we'll get to that as well all right so <laughs> this says you're okay i thought i read that as something else anyway uh let's go ahead and dive right in and let's talk about the new update um let's do that first so I got my phone here. Let me go ahead and open up my phone, get out of my email. Let's head over to a blank screen over here. Not a blank screen, but a screen with some room. And let's talk about, um, let me show you my phone so you can see it. There we go. There's my phone. And um, I'm on, I, I went to a home screen that just has some room so I can show you this new thing. So when you update, and this is an iPhone specific feature because it was one that was missing on iPhone. I think Android already has it. Uh, when you um, update your, your Lightroom on iOS, iPhone specifically, and you're on iOS 16 dot whatever, uh, iOS 16 has widgets that we've had for a while on the screen. And of course, now there's lock screen widgets as well. Lightroom can now take advantage of both of those for specifically the reason you'd want it is for the Lightroom camera. So you can access that professional level camera with all the professional settings in it to change your shutter speed, your, your 
your ISO, so forth and so on, like you would a uh, uh, DSLR or mirrorless. So how do we get to this widget? And, and by the way, the purpose of the widget, <clears throat> the reason that we don't use the Lightroom camera as much as we probably want to or should is because you, you would miss the shot in a moment trying to get to it. Meaning it's much faster to either swipe the lock screen or hit that camera icon directly on your, on your home screen to get to the iOS camera. But the Lightroom camera always required you to launch Lightroom first, wait for it to come up, wait for it to load your images, then tap the camera icon to get to it. And by then, if it wasn't something stationary, you have missed it. So a lot of people would just simply use the iOS camera and never use the Lightroom camera. All right, so I'm going to hold down my um, finger on that blank space. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you get the plus sign. And this will show you all the various widgets you can add. And I'm going to go ahead and scroll down to Lightroom. There it is. So when I tap on Lightroom, you'll notice that there's the Take Photo widget right there. If I swipe over, there's the Take Selfie. So if you want to use the, the front-facing camera versus the rear camera, you can add both of those widgets if you want. There's also, you can just add a widget to get to the, the discovery panel. So if you want to just quickly get to the tutorials or images that are being featured, you can add those widgets as well. I'm going to add the one I really want, which is the take photo. Oh, I, I keep tapping the widget, expecting that to do it. You actually want to tap the add widget button and that will go ahead and rearrange everything. Not what I want it, but that's fine. I'm just going to go ahead and move this one back up to the top. And that's cool the way it is. Okay, so now whenever I need to access the camera, and I could put it on the first home screen, I just didn't want to screw that up for the demo. But um, whenever I want to access the Lightroom camera, just tap it, and boom, it takes you right to it in Lightroom. So there it is. I'm right in the camera right now, looking at some, some new things. But uh, And I'm in the pro settings, so if I wanted to go in and adjust my exposure, my shutter speed, my ISO, my white balance, so forth and so on. I've got those things quickly accessible and the fastest way to get to this camera. All right, so that's great if you're already, oh, your phone's already open, unlocked, so forth and so on. But what if your phone's not un already unlocked and open? So the next thing you might want to do is go to your, um, your lock screen and hold it down on your lock screen and you'll get customize. So when you hit customize, that will let you go in and customize your wallpaper or your lock screen or your home screen. And from here, you can go in and change the widgets. Unfortunately, I wish they would let you do multiple rows of widgets. Like it's just really, this is it. You can change these, but you can't like, so I got to give up one. In other words, to add one in because um, I, I'm using all the space in that widget. I have a wide widget and I have two smaller ones. So I do have to convert one to a smaller one to get four or get rid of one. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of the um, the weather widget for now. And I'm gonna go then and scroll up to Lightroom and add the, now the, notice there's no multiple choices here. This just really take a photo widget and that will let me add it in. I could, could of course move it around in that space and then that's it. So now if I'm on my lock screen, which I'll say done, go back to my lock screen, tap my lock screen, it unlocks my phone, takes me right to the camera. So that's the real feature. That's the best one because I have just as much accessibility from the lock screen to get to that camera as I do the built-in camera app. So that's great. All right, so when I, I made a video about this and it's on my YouTube channel, when I made the video, one of the questions that came in, a couple questions came in about that. Um, and that was um, number one, um, where do those photos go? So if I bring up that camera and I snap a picture, let's, uh, I don't have anything good to take a picture of in this room right now, but let's, let's just go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and tap it. Tap one and take, we'll take a picture of the front of my drone. There we go. We'll snap that photo. All right. So you see it down there in the lower left-hand corner. There it is. Uh, blurry, <laughs> out of focus, but there's the photo. And uh, where's that photo now? Where did it take it? Um, so first and foremost, it bypasses the camera roll. So it doesn't, it doesn't duplicate space, putting it on the camera roll. If you want something on the camera roll, go take it with the regular camera. It puts it right in Lightroom. 
Now, if you have an internet connection, obviously it'll start syncing it up to the cloud, backing it up, full resolution, so forth and so on. If you don't have an internet connection, it'll stay cached on your phone and it will still, even if it backs it up, it's still gonna stay cached on your phone until A, you run out of space or B, it gets old. So Lightroom does a really good job of managing the photos that stay on the device, either ones you've just worked on or are working on, ones that you just recently added stay on the device for a while, as long as there's room. If you got plenty of room, the images stay there. If you don't have plenty of room, it uploads them and then gets rid of them out of the cache as soon as possible. All right, so that's number one. Number two, the other reason why you might want to use this camera, um, especially depending on if you have an older iPhone, from the iPhone, I believe it's the 6S on up. So years ago, 6S, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So several versions back. You have the ability to shoot raw. Today, if you want to shoot raw using Apple's Pro Raw, you need, first of all, an iPhone, of, I think it's 11 on up. And it has to be the pro model. So Lightroom has enabled you to shoot raw all the way back to the 6S. Doesn't need to be a pro model. You can either switch it from DNG, which is raw, or JPEG on the fly. And that was the main reason you were using this camera back in the day is because it was the only, or one of the only cameras that let you shoot in raw from your, from your phone way before Apple let you do it natively. So that's another reason for doing this and having this uh, turned on so you can get to it quickly. Last but not least, um, another question I got was, does it use Apple Pro Raw or just DNG? So it's a legitimate question because they are different. So, um, and here I, I think I brought up a website to, to go over that difference. Here it is. So Apple's Pro Raw is their raw format just like nikon's nef and canon cr2 or cr3 whatever it is now uh, everybody has their own proprietary raw format for their cameras for their devices so apple's no different they have theirs for their camera so to answer that person's question no it's not shooting in apple pro raw because apple's camera shoots in apple pro raw um, this just shoots in a generic dng format um, What's the difference or why would I care? Is one better than the other? You could argue that raw is raw <laughs> and it should be as good a quality as the sensor allows because it's raw, it's supposed to be raw, right? But DN or Apple's Pro Raw does do some processing. It does do some things to make the image look better. So is that raw? Yeah, it's a format, but... Is it the true nature of RAW, which is supposed to be, don't do anything to the photo, capture it from the sensor, let me do my own processing. So depends on which way you want to look at it. So if you want Apple's processing to happen to your RAW files, continue using the built-in camera. If you want just to be able to shoot generic RAW and have all the professional controls, shoot with the Lightroom camera, your choice. All right. Um, Mine is an iPhone 13, still can't add the Lightroom widget even with Lightroom open. Well, Lightroom doesn't need to be open, but you for, what needs to have happened, um, and, and you have to give me more description of why you can't add it. In order to even get to that widget, first you have to down, you have to be on iOS 16 or higher. Two, you have to have downloaded the latest, which just came out, Lightroom update this week. Three, you had to have opened that Lightroom update. So just installing the update won't tell the OS that the widget's there until you launch it. So you have to launch Lightroom first. You know, it doesn't have to be open when you're doing the widget, but it has to have been launched at least once in order for the OS to know that the widgets are there. And then from that point on, you should be able to do what I just showed you in order in, in terms of installing the widget. Uh, so those steps need to happen first. So iOS 16 installing Lightroom and launching it, then once it's been launched once, you should be able to get to the widget. So tell me when you say yours 
still can't add it. What's, what do you mean? You don't see it? Or when you add it, you get an error? Like that can mean a lot of things. So, what do you mean by that? Yes, Paul, raw for the win.、Um, 12 Pro or newer, but only the pros. Yeah, okay. So, 12 Pro or newer. I thought it was 11 Pro.、Uh, thanks. I'm glad you love the picture of Lisa. I'm、uh, just making sure I'm not, since this is a QA session, making sure I'm not missing any questions. All right, let's go back to this original, or, or no, let me, let me finish this first. Then we'll go back to the first question I got, which is about color.、Um, is there an easy way to delete images in Lightroom Mobile? Well, it depends on what you mean by easy. <laughs> There's a, yeah, you can delete them, but it depends on what you mean by. Like, what, do you, what are you classifying as easy? All right, so let me, let me get out of this. Then I'll show you guys. I know you're not seeing it right now. Let me just get to a spot where I can delete some images.、Uh, hang on for a minute. I'm just getting my, getting my demo ready for the question that was just asked. Getting some photos that I don't care about that I could delete. And let's add those to a new album.、Uh, demo, photography masterclass, add album,、um, AMA, ask me anything. All right, boom, add nine photos, add it. Okay, let's go to that album and I'll show you what I'm doing. All right, back to, back to the phone. Oh, sorry, wrong device. Okay, so、uh, the question was Is there an easy way to delete images in Lightroom Mobile? So, the way you delete images in Lightroom Mobile is you select them and then delete them. So, for example, you can、uh, tap the three dot menu, which is what I just did. You can tap select photos, and then you can simply swipe across multiple photos at the same time. That's the way you get rid of them quickly. Now, when you say remove, it's removing them from the album. So I, see, I think I know what you mean now. Because if I do that, oh no, that actually brings up the choice. So remove, what do you want to do? Do you just want to remove them from this album? Because that would be another reason why you hit the trash can. I don't want them in this album anymore, but I still want them in the camera, or I'm sorry, on the、um, all photos, or delete. So delete means not only take them out of this album, But also delete them from the device, which is your question. So, this would be the easiest way, the fastest way to delete photos from Lightroom on mobile. Select first, tap all the ones you want, or swipe through all the ones you want, then hit the trash can, then hit delete if you want to delete, or remove from the album if you want to remove.、Um, I can't think of an easier way than that. Now, you don't want to do it one by, you can do it one by one by holding down, I think, on the photo, and then you'll get a menu and you can say delete, but then that's tedious doing them one by one unless you only want to delete one.、Um, yeah, tap on one photo, and yeah, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> it goes into delete mode. Unless you meant while they're all selected.、Um, all right, great tip. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just looking at all the different questions and comments there. Okay, so、uh, one more before we get into the new questions. Let's go into Lightroom Classic. And in Lightroom Classic,、uh, another new thing that came out this week in the updates、uh, this is literally this week, like I forgot what day this week, but it was this week. Was, I think it was Monday or Tuesday. I think it was Monday. Anyway,、um, if you go into the masking now, so I select a photo, go to develop. Then I click the masking, and then I get the stuff that I always get.、Um, it should be identifying a person there. That's weird that it's not doing that. Huh. All right, we'll do select subject. All right, anyway,、uh, so when I get my mask, now what's new is when you have a mask, whatever, however way you created it, I just did select subject since people w a s n t chiming in right away. You now have the segmented. Um, develop settings just like you do on regular develop. And you also have solo mode. So if you were to right click, you can go, I'm in the solo mode. So that means only one will be twirled down at a time. 
So you notice that basic is open. If I go open detail, then basic would close because detail is open. So you have the segmented um, develop panel as well as uh, solo mode. Also, when you generate a mask, uh, under your mask options now, there's something new here. It wasn't duplicate because you could always do that before. Maybe it's duplicate and invert. I think that's a new command. And then there was something else. I think it might have been hide. You can, oh, you know what? <laughs> we can go to the description. I brought it up because I knew I wouldn't remember. All right, let's go here. Why isn't this popping up in front? Am I missing something here? Um, can't, my browser doesn't want to come up to the front. Now nothing wants to come up to the front. All right, tell you what, we'll turn off this feature. There we go. All right, um, here's what's new. So if we were to go into the December update, new feet, new lenses and cameras and bug fixes as always. The mask panel, this is what's the stuff that's new. Uh, actually, if we go back, we can read that. So in the mask panel, um, Several enhancements like segmented adjustment panels with solo mode, which I just showed you. The eye indicator for the active settings, that was one. And options to delete empty masks, update AI masks, and toggle auto hide for the adjustment panels. Those are the new things. Another thing I almost forgot, so I'm glad I came to this to read it, was that the there's native tether support for Canon cameras so far on macOS devices with Apple Silicon. So what does that mean? Prior to this update, if you were tethering on, on a M1 chip or an Apple Silicon chip, M2, whatever, um, <clears throat> you would have Lightroom open, you would say go tether, Lightroom Classic and say tether, and then it would say, oh, sorry, I gotta relaunch because I gotta do it in Rosetta because tethering isn't supported in um, Apple Silicon. So it would do it. It would just do the thing. It would quit, relaunch, and then you could tether. Then once you quit, once you quit again, it would always relaunch back into the native mode. So now you no longer have to do that for Canon cameras. We're still waiting for that update for uh, Nikon as well. And one more thing I'll warn you guys about. I just discovered it this week, is that if you plan on updating to macOS Ventura, which is the latest macOS, tethering is broken on Nikon cameras. So, natively supported for um, Canon now, but it's broken no matter what on Nikon. So don't upgrade to Ventura if you rely on tethering. Everything else works, but don't, if you rely on tethering, don't upgrade to Ventura. That's all I'm saying. Okay, that was it for the first set of pre-questions. I have some more pre-questions, but I'm gonna get to some of the current ones that were just asked. Um, so the, let's go back to this first question that I saw pop in about color. It's from someone on Facebook. It says, when changing color on text using the eyedropper tool, I get an exclamation point error says gamma. So I'll go try and try and recreate it, but I, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, you can ask me these kinds of questions, but it's hard for me to fix an error A that I've never seen or B that may be happening on your specific setup. So I, I can I if I know what the error is because I've run into it, I can help you. But this is one I've never seen. So I'd be just trying something, show you the way I do it. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, then you'd have to go to tech support on that one because I don't know why you're getting an error about your gamma. Um, and maybe someone else has an answer here that has run into that too. But let's go in. Let's go into this uh, this image here. All right, so let's go to my type tool. Let's see if we can recreate what you're running into. And I'm just gonna go ahead and type in um, New York for pizzeria. All right, so I wanna change the color of that New York, so I would highlight it. 
I would click the um, color widget to come up and let me choose a color, which it brought up over here on another screen. Let's go ahead and bring that over. And if I want to, I can obviously choose whatever color in here that I want, but if I want to use one of the colors that's already in the image, all I have to do is just move out of this box over to the image and I get an eyedropper. So if I wanted to be the same color beige or the same color brick, then I would just click and I'm not getting any kind of gamma warning. So I don't know why you are. I, I certainly believe you're getting those errors, but I just don't know what's causing it. Um, I haven't, I've been doing this for years. I've never run into a problem selecting color for text this way. Uh, so that's the way I do it. Highlight the text, bring up the color widget up here on the control panel. It brings up this box. If I want to use one of these colors or type in a hexadecimal color or type in a color value, great. If I want to use a color from the image, which is what I usually want to do, um, then I just use the eyedropper. Just, I don't have to switch to anything. I just move out of the box and it gives me the eyedropper and I can use the colors that are already in the image, which these won't really, if I use the beige, it just will blend into the background. So let's use one of the colors in the, in the sign there. Okay. So um, not sure why it's giving you that, but it is. And someone says, Illustrator needs this. All right. Dun, 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 dun. When you're tethering, every pick saves to a targeted album via Lightroom. Is that a statement or a question, Paul? Uh, so I'm not sure. Because sometimes conversations are going on in the chat and I see them. And I don't know if they're questions for me or you guys are just talking amongst yourselves, which is fine. Uh, dun, 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 dun. All right, here's one. Ozzy Glover saying, why do I get a blank frame when I run a slideshow? Again, I, I don't know, but I'm going to take some guesses on this one. If you get a blank frame and it's like, let's say you, you have 10 images per slideshow, image one plays, image two plays, image three plays, then you get a blank frame. Then whatever, wherever you get in a blank frame is something to do with that image. My guess is going to be that the slideshow for whatever, or that image for whatever reason hasn't rendered a preview. So that's why you get a blank frame. It's like the preview for that image is not showing in the slideshow. So my suggestion would be um, select all the images in the slideshow. Here, let me show you in Lightroom here. I'm assuming Lightroom Classic because it's the one with slideshows. So let's go here and let's say I wanted to run a slideshow of these, this top row of images. What I would do first to make sure that I could always see them in the slideshow is I go to my, my um, library menu, previews, and I would build one-to-one -one previews for those images that are going to be in the slideshow. That way, you're telling Lightroom right off the bat, even if it built previews before, make sure the previews are current for those images, build them now. Um, and that those previews, by the way, stay with the catalog, not with the, they, even if the images aren't, aren't local, they'll stay with the catalog. And that way, when you run your slideshow, you shouldn't see a blank. Um, if you're still seeing it again, I've exhausted my, I don't know what's going on with your setup. That's all I can think of is that for some reason that image, and you might try, um, where you get into blank space, if you can identify which image it is, like move the image to a different spot. If you're still getting a blank spot when it hits that image, it's something to do with the preview on that image. So you might um, either A, want to replace it, duplicate it, use a, um, a um, what's it called? What's it called? Um, virtual copy, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, try those different things of that image, see if you can get that image to render. All right. Uh, dun, 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 dun. So, so uh, this is back to the color thing. Uh, let's go back to that. So, so you're saying now choose a choose a color that's not in the image. All right, I did that already, but let's do it again. Select color. Um, okay, we'll pick a color that's definitely not in the image, like that. That's not in the image. It it works. So again, I'm not sure why you're getting that. Um, <laughs> I've been reading in a photography group where people have multiple catalogs and they say their computer runs faster. Okay. 
That's a statement, not a question. <laughs> um, if you're asking me to weigh in on that, I'm never going to say use multiple catalogs. You're never going to get me to say it unless one small caveat. You have a business case to do it, meaning you have a user business case like I need them in this catalog so that uh, I can hand that catalog off to the client or I'm working with another photographer and I hand that catalog off to the. So in other words, unless there's some reason you have to keep things separate, it's much messier more time consuming, more everything to have everything in separate catalogs, because then you have to, you have to remember what's where you have to remember to open up that catalog to get to those images. You lose all the capability of combining images over the years into multiple collections. Like there's way more disadvantages to multiple catalogs than there are advantages. Uh, I've been using one big giant catalog for the last decade. No problem. So, if you want to, you can, but it's just not something that I am ever going to say, yeah, do that. Unless that's just what you want to do. All right. Uh, Oliver's chiming in on the multiple catalog thing. Let me move this out of the way. I'm going to get to some other questions. Let me just see this one here. I've used multiple catalogs. I merged them into one a few years ago, much easier to work with and didn't get noticeably slower. Yeah. Again, people, you, people that say things on the internet without giving you like specific stats, it improved my percentage, my, my speed by 20%. This went from 10 seconds to five seconds, whatever, like just it's faster. Well, based on what it feels faster. Okay. All right. So <laughs> moving on. Uh, let's get to some questions where Nicholas asked pre-questions before the stream. And I know he's here in the stream. So let's go ahead and get to some of these. Okay, I did those first two. Uh, let's get to this third one here. Uh, is it somehow possible to use... Oh, this is one. Is it somehow possible to use external flashes, Ellen Chrome, with my iPhone camera or Lightroom camera? And I have the only trigger I've seen that worked for a professional flash was Pro Photo. Like Pro Photo has either an app, I can't remember if they have an app or a physical device that goes on the phone, but they have a way of triggering their, their strobes from an iPhone because I've seen Russell Brown do it for years. Um, I've never seen any other camera manufacturer, or sorry, lighting manufacturer allow that. Meaning that either A, they haven't built an app that does it, or B, they haven't built hardware that does it, like some little uh, USB uh, uh, trigger that would plug into the device. So to my my answer, because I've I got some older Elenchrome strobes, I've yet to see a way to do it. Um, I, maybe if you put them in slave mode and you use the flash on the camera to trigger them, like there's some maybe some weird workaround. But I'm just going to say no. I haven't seen a way to do that. All right. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Photos I take in low light with the Lightroom camera always turn out to be a disaster. The same picture with the iPhone camera will be okay. Oh, the Lightroom camera, okay, versus the iPhone, the built-in camera. Um, the same picture with the iPhone camera will be okay. Something I should think about with the Lightroom camera, or is there something I should think about with the Lightroom camera in low light? I use an iPhone 11. So when you're in the Lightroom camera, let's bring that back up. Let's get out of deleting photos, bring the camera back up. And let me show you what that camera looks like. Okay. When you're in the Lightroom camera, uh, depends on number one, what mode you're in. So automatic is basically like point and shoot, just like the iPhone camera, it does everything for you. So if you're an automatic, you're saying you give me the best shot based on what you see in the scene. If you switch it to professional, just like a DSLR or mirrorless, now you're in control of those settings. Most of them are set to auto still, but you're in control of those settings. So if you're getting poor performance in low light, then I would say, A, you probably wanna stabilize the camera, the phone on a tripod. B, you want to go into um, your shutter speed settings here in the Lightroom camera and adjust the shutter speed just like you would on a regular camera to let it stay open longer, to give you more light, 
to get a better low light photo. So that would be my recommendation for that question. All right, next up. Um, yeah, you said you're using iPhone 11. Shouldn't matter what camera you're using because the Lightroom camera is the same and you are using the same camera, whether it's the, I, the Apple camera app or the Lightroom camera on the same device. So it is it's literally a matter of settings at that point. All right, and one more question from Nicholas. Let's get to this one. Um, this is a long one, so let's, let's see, let's start it out. Which photo genre do you consider to be one where you learn the most to then be able to use in other genres? For example, street photography. You have to be fast, brave, aware of your surroundings, and, no, and, and, not, and not least know your camera. Um, see street photography as a training camp for all future photography. Do you agree? I agree with the logic, not necessarily the genre. Like uh, street, basically your logic is sound. Street photography is a thing that, like you said, you have to be ready in all those areas um, to know your camera, to know your surroundings, to get the shot fast, things could change, people could walk by, whatever. Yes, that will train you for other things. But I guess my, my follow-up question to, to your original question would be, I don't think there's one genre that will prepare you for all other genres. I think there's maybe a genre that will prepare you for other genres. So for example, if you wanted to be a better portrait photographer, then you might, and maybe not practice with celebrities because you don't get the chance to practice with celebrities unless you're already good at portrait photography. But you have to think about celebrities. Like when you take a celebrity photo, you don't have hours. You don't have minutes, several minutes usually. They might grant you five minutes tops. That means everything's got to be ready to go. When they step in front of that camera, they don't want you to be, oh, wait, hold on. I need to change this set. Oh, oh wait, oh, don't move. Like they want to step in, you take the shots and step out. So if I wanted to be better at portrait photography and knowing my camera and getting lighting right and all of those things, I would approach it that way. I would even have people pretend, hey, you're a celebrity. You give me three minutes to get the shot. You don't even know what that person's wearing. You don't know anything. They're just going to walk onto your set. You have three minutes to take the shot and they're going to walk out and then see what you get. Because that will get you better at that type of photography. So... Same thing about, um, I recently shot my first air show. So let me uh, bring up those shots. Hang on for a second. I'm going to go to my Lightroom here, which is where they are. My current work, I'll show you in a second. I know you don't see it. Or maybe you do. Yeah, you do see it. You're seeing it. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to go into... Not current work. It is under events. There we go. And we're going to go to, there's the air show favorites. All right. I just shot my very first ever in life air show. Not that I never shot a, or photographed a plane before, but show, photographing an air show is extremely Difficult if you don't know what you're doing, you don't have the right gear, you don't know your settings, so forth and so on. So I do a lot of prep up front and just knowing what to have my camera set to, knowing what lens I'm going to use, knowing what um, tracking features my camera has or doesn't have, knowing all of those things before I even got to the show. Once I got to the show, it was like all bets are off because those planes, those planes are going to fly by in a, in a formation and they may do it twice, they may not. But that's it. If you didn't get it, you didn't get it. And like to get some of these shots, it, you know, like that one, I might have taken 30 of those as they were passing by and only one came out good. So you, you have to be prepared. So what I'm saying here in this particular genre is that if I were trying to get better at sports photography, this would be a good place to practice because things are fast moving. 
You got to always be ready. You got to always be able to get the shot. You got to be able to know your camera, gear, lighting, all that stuff. And most of it's out of your control. Like you don't know where the ball is going to land. You don't know who's going to catch it. You don't know who's going to kick it. You don't know who's going to be like tackle whoever. You don't know who's going to hit whatever. Baseball is pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. Like you know where that stuff's going to happen. But any other sport, you don't know what's going to happen when. And you're only guessing. You're trying to get ahead of what the action is at any given time to take the shot. So when you, like, yeah, with them on the ground, got all day. No problem to get that shot right. But when they're in the air, like, good luck, buddy. Know what you're doing because if you don't get the shot, if you don't know what you're doing up front or at least have had some practice, it's you're going to walk home disappointed or you're going to go home disappointed. So to answer your question, yes, there are specific genres that can get you ready for other genres, but I don't think there's one like street photography wouldn't have got me ready for this. See what I mean? So there isn't one that will get you ready. You just have to get to a similar one that will get you ready. One that's going to challenge you. That's harder to maybe do maybe the easier one or maybe the easier one to do the harder one. I don't know what it would take, but just do similar genres where the requirements are the same. Uh, air shows, fast moving objects that you have to be ready for and they're, you, they're unpredictable. Unless you've seen the show a million times, you know exactly what they're about to do next, but still unpredictable. Um, and knowing your settings and knowing all that stuff. So that answers that question, hopefully. All right, that is Nicholas. I hope I answered your questions. Let's keep moving. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Okay, good morning from San Francisco, Dwayne writes. Uh, do you think it's a still a great idea to specialize in one genre of photography or is it better to do various shoots if you want to be su successful in the photography business? Easy answer. If I'm looking for a photographer to do a specific thing, I want to go to their portfolio, their website, their whatever, and see that specific thing. For example, if I'm looking for a wedding photographer for my daughter's wedding, not happening yet, but I'm just saying, if I'm looking for a wedding photographer for my daughter's wedding, and I go to your portfolio and I see the Blue Angels, I'm probably going to go to the next portfolio. So a generic photographer probably does less business than one that's really good at a specific genre or two. So if I wanted to have portraits, family photos, baby pictures, all of that, I want to go to that photographer. I don't want to go to the one that's shooting the, the Bucks game. See what I mean? It's just like, I, I'm going to look at your work and if I see random stuff of all the different, I'm just going to say, oh, you know, that's cute. That's good but you don't really specialize in anything that I know so, or that I'm looking for. So I'm going to go to the person that does specialize in what I'm looking for. All right. Uh, next up. Hi, I'm in, um, I guess that's STL. Is that St. I, I, I don't know. Is that St. Louis? And I've been collecting cameras for 45 years, 250 vintage ones. When and where to sell some of them? Um, I don't know. I, I don't, I've never sold vintage cameras. I'm going to guess that a traditional camera store or traditional place that buys used gear is probably not going to be the answer because they're trying to get low. They're trying to give you a low price to sell it to somebody else. So when you say vintage, I'm thinking usually one of a kind, not that many around. So you want the most you can get for it by a collector or someone that really uh, appreciates it. So in that case, I'm going to probably say one of the traditional sources, maybe not eBay, but one of those traditional auction sites where you set the price and you let people bid on it and people buy it directly from you. All right. Um, thank you. Glad you love my work, Dwayne. Uh, question offset. <coughs> in the future, get an assistant compatibility report. All right, Ken's asking a question about hardware. Um, 
A question off subject, maybe you can answer in the future. I'm getting a system compatibility report looking for Intel Hudson. All right, uh, I guess sounds like you're looking for a new computer and you've picked out an Intel processor maybe. Um, other than that, I don't know much more than what you want me to say. Is, is like you want me to give you a computer recommendation or are you headed in the right direction? Uh, I'll just say this generically when I get computer requests. Basically, I don't know your budget, so I don't know how much you can spend or want to spend. I'm going to say the things that matter, no matter what platform you're on, the things that matter most when you're doing this type of, um, uh, uh, when you're setting up a system for this type of work, um, in this order, memory, RAM, GPU, meaning graphics chip, CPU, hard drive. So in that order, those would be the things I concentrate on because usually the RAM maxes out at a certain amount on each device and some you can change, some you can't. Most of the Mac devices, you can't up, upgrade the RAM later, like on laptops. So get as much RAM as you think you're ever going to need or as much as you can afford up front. Then the graphics chip, again, depend if you have your choice of graphics processors, because a lot of Lightroom and Photoshop are moving their intensive processes to the GPU to relieve the CPU from working. So I want a fast graphics processor. Then I want a good processor overall. And then, of course, enough hard, fast hard drive space to do what I need to do. Uh, Scott Kelby says I don't use RAM. <laughs> of course you don't. Uh, Scott, you, you're lying because I know you just got a brand new, beautiful studio machine that you love that's, that's beefed up and has got all the stuff in it you want. All right. Um, dun, 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 dun. What's the best output sharpening for prints in Lightroom, generally speaking, to delivering, uh, delivering to a client? So output sharpening for prints. Okay. So I want to make sure I saw the full question. So let's go back to Lightroom. Let's say that I wanted to make a print of this and I go to, so either one of two, either I'm going to do it from the export menu or I'm going to do it from the print module, either one. Uh, if I were to go to export and I scroll down to output sharpening, sharpen four, it kind of already has it right there. Matte paper or glossy paper. These are two, these are the two for print. Now, the amount is where it gets, depending on what you want. So I would say for a portrait, I'd leave it on standard. For everything else, I'd put it on high. Um, because typically for portraits, I've already sharpened them as much as I want. I want a little bit more for output. But for architectural photos, landscapes, everything else, I can usually go higher. Um, so that's one for output. And you get the same kind of thing when you go into the print module. And we pick a better template. Uh, let's do that. Okay, and we say, we scroll down here, print sharpening, uh, low standard or high, and media type, matte or glossy. All right, so that's your two places to do it from Lightroom if you're outputting for sharpening. Either exporting the image out to send to a lab or you're making your own print. And even if you're going to make your own print and print it to your own printer or you're going to output it for a lab, you can do that right here in the print module because your, your print to can either be a JPEG file or an actual printer connected to your device. All right. <laughs> ah, when I load my images, all right, Fred's asking a, a good question. When I import my images into Light, Wait, hold on. Oh, I, I read that wrong. Okay, when I load my images from my Nikon cameras into Lightroom Mobile, they come in as NEF files. How do I convert them to DNGs? You don't. So there's there's only, of the three Lightrooms that we're talking about, Lightroom on Mobile, Lightroom on Desktop, and Lightroom Classic, there's only one of those that converts to DNG. Lightroom Mobile doesn't. And Lightroom Desktop doesn't. Lightroom Classic does. So either A, you don't, <laughs> or B, uh, once they've been uploaded, synced to the cloud, and you have syncing enabled in Lightroom Classic, if you're a Lightroom Classic user, 
and they sink back down, then you can go ahead and uh, I don't know if I have any any uh, files here. Let me see. I may have one or two. And let me think about where I might have some NEF files that I'm willing to show you. Let's go here. These are all DNGs. All right, I'll, sh I'll show you the menu even if I don't come up with any photos. Um, Yep, these are all converted. Convert. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I usually do my conversions, so I'm probably not going to find too many. Oh, I found some. Here are some that aren't converted. I just found some right here. These didn't get converted yet. All right, so let's do let's do a few of these. I don't need to do that many. So these were shot um, and imported into Lightroom on my desktop, and then. Brought into Lightroom Classic just via syncing, and then I renamed them, but I never converted them. So these are NEF files. If I select them, I can go to uh, Library, and I can convert photos to DNG. So you don't have this option on mobile, definitely, and you don't have this option even in the other Lightroom on desktop, but you do have it here. So if you want to convert to DNG and delete the original uh, NEF files after con six, only after successful conversion, you can do that, and DNG medium preview, do it, go. Um, it will go and convert those files for you. So you, you don't have to wait for that. You can keep working. It's a background process and it will take as long as it takes uh, to do that. Um, <laughs> do you ever think of color profile when you export print? Or Oh, absolutely. So Nicholas is asking, do I ever think of color profile when I'm exporting? Um, Adobe RGB versus uh, sRGB. Yes, absolutely. For print, and if I'm handing the client a high high res photo for them to go off and do something with, I'm always using Adobe RGB. For everything else, web, social media, uh, on-screen presentations, slideshows, whatever, then I'm going to do it as sRGB. So I absolutely do think of that. Yep, the Atlanta airport photos. Uh, All right, good. There's a testimonial about RAM. That's why I listed RAM so high. Uh, Kevin says, uh, Lightroom was taking five to seven minutes, wow, to load on my uh, laptop. I doubled the RAM from eight to 16 gigs. Now it opens in 20 seconds. Wow, should have done this years ago. And that's what I mean. So RAM is like, that's why it's at the top of my list. Because what people don't realize or think about is that whatever the amount of RAM is, and you look at the system requirements, let's, I don't know what they are, but let's say that Lightroom says it needs eight gigs. Oh, well, I've got eight gigs. We're all set. <laughs> it needs eight gigs or wants eight gigs or whatever the recommendation is. Your operating system still has to run and any other things you have running in the background still have to run and they're taking RAM too. So whatever the minimum requirement for the application is, a good rule of thumb is to minimally double it for what you're buying. So if, if, if it says it takes eight, don't ever try and get less than 16. If it says it takes 12, don't ever try and get less than 32. Like always go at least double or more than what the system requirements are for the applications you're gonna run. And then you gotta think about, am I gonna run Lightroom and Photoshop together? What are those minimum requirements? Then double that. So you, no one, okay, things people never complain about. I never hear anyone say, I just have too much RAM. My computer runs too fast. I have too much money. Like things no one ever says. So no one complains about having too much storage space. My closet is too empty. I wish there were more stuff in it. My hard drive is so empty. God, I just have too much room for all these photos I'm going to take. Things no one ever says. So by all means, if budget permits, buy as much of those things as you can afford. All right. Um, all right. So how to take Lightroom with all the collections and settings to a new PC. So Lightroom uh, is an application you're going to install on a new PC. Your catalogs, if you're talking about Lightroom Classic, 
are in a folder. So you would take that whole folder. The photos need to go with it wherever they're stored as well. And they all need to be in the same structure. So if you're, you said PC, so if your catalog's on the C drive and um, pictures and, and videos and in a folder called Lightroom, then that folder structure needs to be identical for everything to work right. And not so much the catalog, but definitely your photos. So if your photos are on the D drive in a photo, folder called uh, My Photos, and on that on the old drive, it's capital M and capital P for My Photos. On the new drive, if you do lowercase m and lowercase p, it won't know where they are. So uh, the structure has to be identical. And then you just, it's just a matter of copying everything over to the ex identical structure. All right. Um, Yep, people will always complain about the price, but they will never complain about having too many of those things, too much of those things. All right, folks, I, I can't believe it. I'm out of time. So with that said, that's it. That was a good Q&A. Thanks for all the great questions. I you, People are usually shy and they don't ask questions. I usually have to have a bunch pre-prepared. This time I only had like three or four pre-prepared and the rest all came live. So thank you guys. Uh, have a great holiday break. Uh, if you spend time with friends, family, spend time doing with what you love, even if you don't have friends and family. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you after the first of the year. Uh, you can go to my YouTube channel, follow me on social over there, wherever it is. And uh, that will get you to all my previous shows and all the things I've done. Thanks, guys. Have a great one.